<laughs> okay, I think we're ready to roll. Looks like everyone's here. So this week is going to be pretty ugly for you guys because I think I have something like seven lectures and two labs just from me. So just keep telling yourself, if I can make it through fri till Friday, everything will be okay. It's, it's like hell week for the Navy SEALs where you, you know, it's just push them to the breaking point. Well, anyway, if you can, can handle seven lectures of my Texas accent, then you'll be okay. So uh, what I'm going to do today, if my thing works here, first thing with instruments is turn them on and, whoops, oh, the second thing, after you turn on the instrument, put the little dealy in the computer so it can talk. And there's that. And come on, machine. All right, let's see here. It's off. Now it's back on. Well. Kurt, I think you have to um, take it out of, of presentation mode. Oh, okay, maybe so. Okay, yeah. now start it up again. All right. And now your now this should work. Yes. There you go. Look at that. Well, now you understand why I'm a theoretician. Nobody will ever let me go to sea with an instrument. <laughs> <laughs> Although I do like to do that, they just won't let me. Okay, so what I'm going to do today is start out with some philosophical, almost theological comments on what this stuff light is and then we'll get back to the sort of reviewing the basics of what you need to know from this class a lot of it you've already seen from Colin and others you'll see it again from me in a little fancier way maybe and then that's to define all the radiometric terms and then the second lecture today Ken will talk about how do you actually measure these things because as you've seen with IOPs there's often a big distance between the definition of something like absorption and how you actually measure it. And then the labs today, uh, after the clouds clear off and the sun comes out, you'll have a radiometer lab outside and then I'll have another lecture from me this afternoon. So anyway, uh, about six or eight months ago, I had a book chapter submitted and it was reviewed by this fellow named Michael Mischenko, who is like the god of radiative transfer theory, and he made me do things. I, I had statements in the paper like theta phi is the direction of photon travel, and he made me take all of those statements out and say things like theta phi is the direction of energy propagation or the direction of radiance or something, but I was literally not allowed to use the word photon in the paper. So anyway, I thought, well, that's kind of strange. So. I went and I spent like three months reading a bunch of papers and I realized, yeah, Mischenko's right. And what I learned in physics class in 1960 is not the current thinking. So I've been off on this big tangent now about trying to do things right. And I used to have a page on the Ocean Optics web book called The Nature of Light. And I actually pulled that down uh, because there were statements in there that were not correct by our current understanding. And so I'm rewriting that page, but it's turning out to be very difficult to say something that's, you know, without saying something wrong. It's, it's really a mess. But anyway, that's what we're going to start out with is a few minutes of that. And then I will go over once again these things about how you define how much light there is, things like radiance, where it's going. How do you specify directions? We'll talk about radiance. We'll talk about irradiances, all of which you've seen along the way, but it won't hurt to see them again. So I put together here, after I was reading all these papers, a little brief history of light. You know, and is it a particle? Is it a wave? Is it neither one? Is it both? And if you go back to over 2,000 years ago, this fellow Democritus, where we get our name democracy, he had the idea that everything was made up of particles, which he called atomos, or atoms. And so light was a particle, water is a particle, people are made up of particles, etc. And of course, this was just guesswork at the time. There was no way to, 
to test his hypothesis, but that was it. Uh, in the 11th century, there was a fellow, Alhazen, as he's usually called in English. He was sort of the Middle Ages Arabic Isaac Newton. And he did phenomenal work in optics and all kinds of things. And he's not very well recognized uh, in the West anymore, but his book, or one of his books, was translated, and it inspired all kinds of people from Newton to Copernicus and, and others because he was writing on all kinds of subjects. Uh, anyway, uh, and he discovered, for example, Snell's Law. He just doesn't get credit for Snell's Law, but you know, the usual story. It's the guy that publishes in the best publication gets the credit, and he was publishing in Arabic, and nobody in Europe could read Arabic, so Snell gets the credit, but Alhazen actually had it first. Uh, anyway, in the 1600s then, there was this philosophical debate about the nature of light, and so Rene Descartes, for example, he said light's a wave, and Newton said, no, no, light's particles. It's what you call corpuscles. So it's a little stream of particles. And uh, at the same time as Newton, uh, Huygens and Fresnel were saying, no, no, light's a wave. And so it went back and forth. But then finally, in the early 1800s, Young did what's called this double slit experiment, which if you've had freshman physics, you know about it. If you haven't, you don't. But anyway, he did an experiment that showed conclusively that light has to be a wave. So it was sort of thought that that settled it. And late 1800s then, Maxwell's equations came along. Uh, they explained light as propagating electromagnetic waves, and so that was consistent. But then the problem started in 1900 with Max Planck. In order to explain black body radiation, he had to assume that emission processes and absorption in his black, the walls of his black body that that only came in discrete pieces. It was quantized. And that was the beginning of quantum theory. And then shortly thereafter, Einstein was able to explain the photoelectric effect because there he had to sort of assume that light comes in discrete pieces, which he called quanta. And you can't explain the photoelectric effect if light is a wave. So then the thinking went back, well, maybe light's a wave. And then it went on as quantum mechanics was developed, people kind of had to face the fact that depending on the experiment you'll do, you'll either detect a wave property or a particle property for light. So there was this phrase, the wave-particle duality. And then in 1926, a chemist invented the word photon, but sort of in a different context. And then in the sort of middle to late 1900s, uh, People like uh, Feynman uh, developed this theory called quantum electrodynamics, which is how we now understand the interactions of light and charged particles. And the view there is that light is these things called photons, and uh, they have a lot of really bizarre properties, though. You can't pin down where they are. If light's going from here to here, it takes all possible paths with equal probability. And uh, they f sort of, a photon fills all the space between where it was created and where it was absorbed. So things just get really weird there. And then, for example, you can do Young's uh, double slit experiment with one photon at a time, and you still get exactly the same interference pattern. So the photon is some way going through both slits and interfering with itself. And that's like the most fundamental experiment in all of quantum mechanics, that there's just no explanation in terms of classical physics. You just have to say, this is the way light works, just live with it. And now today in elementary particle theory, we're kind of back to the Greeks, that everything is, is a particle, but all particles have wave properties associated with them. So the answer here, in Buddhist theology, um, there's a fellow, um, what was his name? Uh, God, I'm a senior moment. Anyway, he had this, in Western philosophy, we have this idea that like something's true or it's false. And this fellow, uh, God, I can't think of his name. He had a Buddhist theory that 
a statement can be true, it can be false, it can be both true and false at the same time, and it can be neither true nor false at the same time. And to a Westerner, that sounds kind of crazy. If you're a Buddhist, you may say, well, yeah, everybody knows that. It's kind of the same story here. They're particles, they're waves, they're neither, they're both. Um, uh, Nagarjuna, Nagarjuna's tetralemma. So Nagarjuna was this uh, Buddhist philosopher back in uh, like 800 or so. Okay, the bottom line though is whatever photons are, if you want to say it that way, they're defined by their energy or equivalently their frequency or wavelength or linear momentum. They're all, you can get one from the other. So they're defined by how much energy they have, their angular momentum, and their state of polarization. And that's it. That's all you can say about a photon. Has this energy, has this polarization, has this angular momentum. Things like position or path are not defined and have no meaning for photons. So you can't localize a photon like you can say there's a 90% probability that there's an electron in the left half of, of this box. You can't say that for a photon. It just doesn't work in quantum mechanics. And um, so these ideas like particle and wave, those are very simple classical physics models for how the world works, but light doesn't really fit one of those models or the other. It's doing what it does, and photons behave perfectly normally the problem is you're trying to describe them in a language that doesn't fit what photons do. And so if you look at some of the things Nobel Prize winners have said about photons, so Einstein said in all of his 50 years of trying to figure out what photons are, he still has no idea, you know, what the things are. And he had this statement that every, uh, in English, Tom, Dick, and Harry, uh, thinks he knows what a photon is, but he's always wrong. And Feynman said, well, nobody knows what they are, and it's best if you just try not to think about it. Uh, you should just, you know how to do the calculations, and we can predict very well what light will do, but just don't worry about what all this means. Uh, there's a guy, Roy Glauber, who got his Nobel Prize for quantum optics, and he says, I don't know anything about photons, but I know one when I see one. And, <laughs> and he says his definition of a photon is that a photon is what a photo detector detects. <laughs> and then the best of them, there's this fellow, Willis Lamb, who he discovered a thing called the Lamb shift in hydrogen that was the experiment that forced the development of quantum electrodynamics on us because that can't explain, be explained by regular quantum mechanics. And he was really on a rant. He published a paper called The Non-Photon. And he says, there's no such thing as a photon. It's only a comedy of errors and historical accidents that led to its popularity among physicists and optical scientists. And it's high time that we give up the use of the word photon. It's a bad concept. And he actually gave out licenses to people to, uh, if you didn't have one of his licenses, you were not allowed to use the word photon. And there were only like six people ever got a license from him. So anyway, in spite of what Lamb says, most physicists today are happy to use the word photon, and I do, and, and you're allowed to, uh, but you just have to, and they really do exist in spite of Lamb's viewpoint. But you just have to be careful not to think of them as like little balls of light or something. They're much more complicated. And all you can say is, for example, a photon was created at some point, so maybe there's an atom transitioning in a filament and a light bulb, and it emits an, uh, a photon. And you can say over here the photon was absorbed at a particular point, so maybe that's at some particular pixel in a CCD array. And that's all you can say. You can't say anything about the path the photon took from where it was created to where it was absorbed and so on. And uh, Feynman's viewpoint, uh, he's one of the great physicists of the 20th century that developed QED. And his viewpoint is that a single photon takes all possible paths through space from point A to point B. And so those different paths can go through both slits of an interferometer, for example. And others take the viewpoint that 
the photon is emitted and it kind of comes out of the point where it's emitted and it fills all of space and then it's absorbed and it's kind of sucked down into that one point. Uh, it doesn't really matter. Uh, both of those viewpoints are undoubtedly wrong, but you can do the calculations and that's all that uh, matters. So enough said, if you want to follow up on this, there's a book called QED, The Strange Story of Light and Matter by Feynman. It's a very readable, you know, non-mathematical book. Start with that one. In the library, there's a file called what is a photon.pdf, and that's a collection of four or five or six papers written by top quality physicists about our current thinking about how to view light. There's a video in there that I stole off of YouTube that shows single photon interference patterns being built up. There's another video that claims it's the first experiment that simultaneously shows both particle and wave properties of light. So anyway, you can follow up on that if you want. You don't need to know that for being an optical oceanographer. And I can just kind of warn you that the w deeper you get into this, the weirder it gets. Uh, but it's quite an interesting, uh, you know, road to follow if you want to go down it just for your own fun. But just keep in remember, or, or remember that most of what's said about photons, if you Google it on, you know, come up with some Wikipedia page that some guy wrote, uh, you know, it's often simply wrong. It's always oversimplified, including anything I say. Uh, and, you know, it may be outdated. And the, really the way to think of it is photons are defined by what they do, not by what they are. And we can predict what they're going to do without knowing exactly what these things are. And I don't really have any mental image of a photon. You know, I have a mental image of an electron. It's like this little thing. And if you put a bunch of them in a bottle, it would, they would look yellow or something. But uh, I don't have that at all for photons. Okay. So all you need to know is they have some energy. So I'll call it Q. So that's energy in joules. They have some frequency. So per second, they have some wavelength, meters or nanometers. And if that's H is Planck's constant and C is the speed of light, those things are related by the energy is Planck's constant times the frequency or H times the speed of light divided by the wavelength. And that's all you need right there to be an optical oceanographer. Uh, they do have linear momentum, which is given by Planck over the wavelength or energy over the speed of light. Uh, we just don't use that much in, in oceanography. If you're a physicist, it's a big deal, but doesn't f filter into optical oceanography because the momentum carried by photons is totally insignificant compared to the momentum carried by moving water and waves and so forth. Whereas the energy com carried by photons is very important on the oceanographic scale because that's what heats water, grows phytoplankton, and so on. And they also have angular momentum, which is once again in, uh, unimportant compared to the angular momentum of, you know, moving, rotating phytoplankton and things like that. The angular momentum does not depend on wavelength, the linear does. Okay, so just commit this equation to heart and you're good to go. So if we want to do an example calculation and say, well, you know, how many photons are there, um, you know, say hitting the surface of the ocean on a given sunny day? Well, if you look in light and water, there's in the visible wavelengths, typically about 400 watts per square meter, three, four, five on a sunny day. So if we take the average one is 500 nanometers, uh, you could take, you know, energy over H times C divided by wavelength. So that's the energy per photon. Going back to right here, HC over lambda energy per photon. So you take the total energy divided by the energy per photon, and you get there's, there's order of, say, 10 to the 21st photons hitting each square meter of the sea surface per second on a sunny day. So an enormous number of photons. And then if you say, well, okay, those guys are hitting the surface, but they're then moving through the water. 
And so how many photons would there be in a cubic meter of water at any given instant? Well, the speed of light in the water is C over index of refraction. So we take how many photons per square meter per second divided by how fast they're moving through a cubic meter of water. And you get there somewhere like 10 to the 12th photons per cubic meter of seawater at any given instant. And that's just coincidentally about the same as the number of phytoplankton per cubic meter. So on the other hand, each phytoplankton is getting hit by a huge number of photons per second as they move through the cubic meter of water. So that's kind of how you can do these calculations and we'll be talking later about uh, PAR, which is photons per second. And if you're a phytoplankton, it's not the energy you absorb, it's how many photons you absorb that determine how much photosynthesis you can do. So these kind of calculations do get used. And Ken will discuss polarization later. Okay, so onward to radiometry now. You've seen our little flowchart here. All of last week was up in the blue box for inherent optical properties, absorption and various measures of scattering, beam attenuation, backscatter, and so forth. So you guys have now mastered this box here. So this lecture now is to start working on the red box of radiometric variables, defining the radiance and various irradiances, and then uh, we'll have the lab on measuring those things, and then also the rest of this week we'll be getting into this box here and into the radiative transfer equation box to see where all of that comes from. So basically radiometry is the science of measuring electromagnetic or radiant energy. And in general, there's sort of two types of detectors. There are detectors that respond to how much energy they absorb, and there are, those are usually called thermal detectors because the energy heats something up. So a thermometer is a thermal detector. You shine light on it, the mercury absorbs the light, it heats it up, the mercury rises in the column, and you've got a detector for how much energy is absorbed. And then there's quantum detectors, which basically count absorption events, or if you wish, they count photons. And so they're counting the number of things. This is counting the total energy of these things, whatever they are. And Ken will, I'm sure, tell you more that radiometric calibration is really, really difficult. Uh, you can go to Radio Shack, uh, buy a voltmeter that puts out seven decimal place accuracy for voltages and currents you'd have to be really good to get better than 2% accuracy on radiometric calibrations. Okay, so the first thing, a little review of specifying directions. We're always going to be needing to say the light's traveling in this direction or the energy or the radiance, whatever. So uh, I use the Greek letter C for that. So you normally, you pick a coordinate system, X, Y, Z, that's convenient for your problem. Uh, in hydrolite, X will be downwind, Z will be into the water, but it doesn't matter. So you pick a coordinate system, and then you need to specify direction. So I could give X, Y, Z coordinates of this point up here, and let the unit, let the length of this red vector be length one, I could specify that as a theta phi direction with length r equals one. Uh, either way, and then I could give the x, y, z components of the vector, or I can give the r, z angles of the vector relative to my coordinate system. And so uh, if you just look at this figure and you say, well, okay, if here's my direction c, then what's the z component? Well, here's a theta, and you have to look here, and oh, there's a right angle here, and so this distance here is just one times cosine of theta. So the z component is just the cosine theta. And so then this side here of this little right triangle, that's the sine theta, and there it is down here, so if I want to get the x component and I look at phi here, oh, well, then 
this direction here or this distance here, the y component is sine of theta times sine of phi, and this distance here or this leg here, that's sine of theta times cosine of phi. So you just look at this, do some high school trigonometry, and you can write your direction C as being x, y, and z components times x, y, and z unit vectors, or you can write x as being sine theta cos and phi times x component, and so on. And then the inverse equations are if you need to know theta, then you take the inverse cosine of the z component, and phi is the inverse tangent of the y over z component. And people often let the cos and theta be mu, uh, just a shorthand that's commonly used. And this is a unit vector, so the magnitude of a vector is it's dotted with itself, so that's cx plus y plus z, the squared components, that has to add up to one. Okay, so that's the math of specifying directions of where the light's going. Was question? Okay, so be forewarned, in radiative transfer theory, theta and phi always define or refer to the direction the light is going. You read a paper written by an instrument person, and they say, well, we measured the radiance, and here's a plot, and it's theta phi. That direction is probably the direction he pointed his instrument, which is opposite to the direction the light is going. And I always try to distinguish those. I have theta v for viewing direction, which is pi minus theta, and phi v viewing direction is the direction the light is going plus phi. So I'm always very careful to distinguish viewing directions from the direction the light is going, but not everybody is that careful. So it can be a little confusing when you read a paper and it just kind of doesn't make sense and you realize, oh, well, these are measured values, not the direction the light is going. Okay, uh, a thing we're always having to do is compute the scattering angle between two directions. So the light is starting out in this direction, it scatters off a particle and it ends up going in this direction, and then the angle in between is the scattering angle. So how do you get that? Well, we can write the c prime dot c, and I always let prime be the initial direction, and unprimed is the final direction, uh, just my convention. Um, the angle between two vectors is the magnitude of the vectors times the cosine of the angle in between, and the magnitudes here are one, so if I know these two vectors, direction vectors, I take their dot product and I get the cosine of the angle in between. Well, if you can write that out, you can either do it in terms of x, y, z components, or if you write the vectors in terms of the theta primes and the thetas and the phi primes and the phis, you just plug in there and you'll get this little formula right here. And, you know, I use this like all day, every day. So you might as well just learn it if you're going to do radiative transfer theory. Okay, then the other thing is defining solid angles and computing them. And Collins sort of said this, but I'll say it again. Um, if you have a plane, so you want to define the plane angle. The definition of a plane angle theta simply says, Put a circle, you know, centered at your point here, some radius r, you measure the arc length subtended by the angle, you take the arc length divided by the radius of the circle. And that's the definition of theta. Angle is arc length over radius, and so it's really non-dimensional. But we call it radians to remind ourselves that it's really an angle we're talking about. So if I have a whole circle here, the circumference of a circle is 2 pi times the radius, so the angle for a whole circle is 2 pi r over r is 2 pi radians per circle. Okay, you all knew that. For defining a solid angle, you now put a sphere here. The sphere has radius r, and then if you've got some little area on the surface of the sphere, and you say, well, what's the solid angle of that area 
as seen from the center of the sphere, you simply take the area here divided by the radius squared. And that's the definition of the solid angle of that patch of area. So area over R squared. A whole sphere has a surface area that's uh, 4 pi R squared. So a whole sphere has 4 pi R squared divided by R squared is 4 pi steradians in a sphere. And steradian just means solid stare for the Greek solid. So there's 4 pi steradians in a whole sphere just like there's 2 pi radians in a whole circle. So that's all that, all that uh, goes into solid angles for defining them. Now to compute them, you've seen this little formula from Colin that says the element of solid angle is sine theta d theta d phi. Well, where that comes from is here's our coordinate system, sphere, radius r, and then let's take a little air element of area on the surface. So that little element of area divided by r squared is the little element of solid angle for that area. And then you just have to look at this and say, well, okay, so the side of this, this rectangle here, that's r d theta, okay? And this side here, you have to take, you look at this and say, oh, this distance here is r sine theta, and then it's being moved through a d phi. So this little side here is r sine theta d phi, and you're dividing then by r squared, the r's go out, and you end up with sine theta d theta d phi. So that's where that actually comes from. And then, uh, or if you write uh, sine theta d theta as d of cosine theta or d mu, then it's just d mu d phi. Um, okay, if you want to use this now to compute the solid angle of something. So let's say you've got a little, uh, an instrument, it's got a little circular opening and there's some half angle of the thing. Ha what's the solid angle of that? Well, you could put, here's the opening of the instrument and here's your detector down here, some half angle. So you could just sort of put that at the north pole of a coordinate system and then say the solid angle here is the integral from theta prime equals zero uh, to two pi, oh, sorry, phi prime, zero to two pi, and then theta prime is going from zero out to whatever this half angle theta is, and there's our element of solid angle. You do the integration, and this is two pi times one minus cosine of the half angle. So nice little formula. And of course, if theta is pi over two, so you've expanded the whole to be a whole sphere, then cosine of uh, 100, or sorry, not pi over two, it's cosine of pi, then cosine is minus one, and so minus of minus one is two, and then you've got four pi, so it all checks out. Okay, that's the math. Now, we wanna actually measure radiance, the sort of, uh, you know, fundamental idea of an instrument to measure radiance is what's called a Gaussian tube radiometer. So you, you're going to have a tube here, you're going to have a detector down here, and it's looking out through a hole in the tube. Now, you only want the light that comes more or less straight in to make it to your detector. You don't want light that's coming in from some other angle to be detected. So you paint the walls black, maybe you put some baffles in here, and some way that light that is not within your small little solid angle is not going to make it to the detector, and the light that's coming in through some little angle alpha here will make it to your detector. So you've got this collecting tube or Gaussian tube. You normally put a diffuser in here, and what that does is after the light goes through the diffuser, it's a homogeneous light field. So you can make a small detector 
instead of having to have a detector that's that big, you can have a smaller one, and if the detector is a tenth the area of the diffuser, then you just mo multiply your numbers here by 10, and you get to work with a smaller detector than a more expensive, bigger one. And then you'll probably have a filter in here because you only want to measure a certain wavelength range. So this is the basic idea here of how to measure radiance, and so you're going to have you're going to detect so and so many watts of power. You have a collection area here of so many meters. You have a solid angle of some little, so many uh, steradians and a wavelength band of some little size delta lambda. So you get the radiance as being watts per square meter per steradian per nanometer. Okay, and in reality, if you put polarizing filters out here, you can measure the polarization of the light field and you get a, what's called a Stokes vector of which the radiance is just the first component. So that's kind of the idea. A more modern detector, you may have a lens here, you may have a pinhole and a photo detector back here, but the idea is the light that's coming more or less straight in will be focused down, it'll go through the pinhole, it'll make it to the detector light that's coming in at an angle will not make it through the pinhole. So one way or another, you only get the light that's in your little solid angle. And of course, then you put, um, you know, wavelength filters and such in here. But that's the basic idea of what's called a well collimated radiometer. So is the objective lens doing the same as the diffuser? The um, well, in this case, uh, the objective lens here is just focusing light down to ideally a point so that it will either go through your little uh, pinhole here or it won't. So in a sense, um, you know, I don't know if you'd say it's playing the role of the diffuser, but... Yeah. Okay, here's a bunch of well collimated radiometers out of one of Mischenko's papers. So there's the Hubble Space Telescope. It's looking at a really small little solid angle. There's a radio telescope. There's your camera. Now the camera might have a wide angle lens, but each pixel on the CCD array is mapping to just one little bitty solid angle out here. So that's how you build up an image of what's out there. And the same thing with the human eye. You know, the light coming from here goes to some little point on the retina. The light from over there is another little point on the retina, and then I get this nice image. So pixel by pixel, or photoreceptor by photoreceptor in the eye, I've really got a bunch of independent little uh, Gerson tube radiometers, and then there's a Gerson tube instrument there, so they're still certainly in use. Okay, so uh, we've already uh, gone through this, you know, the spectral radiance, you take the energy you measure divided by how long you sample for area, solid angle, wavelength, and you get radiance. And so this is the spectral radiance, which normally means per unit wavelength interval. So it'll be the spectral radiance at 400 nanometers, and then the bandwidth and the fine print says was 10 nanometers. Some people, when they write a paper, they'll say, I measured spectral radiance, and it just kind of means as a function of wavelength, but they tend not to tell you th it's things about bandwidths and all of that. So be forewarned that to most people, spectral means at a particular wavelength, per unit wavelength interval. To other people, spectral simply means I measured something as a function of wavelength. Um, and it can be a little, little bit confusing. And what hydrolyte computes as its fundamental output is the spectral radiance as a function of depth, directions, theta phi, and wavelength. And it'll be, if you run hydrolyte with a five nanometer bandwidth, it's getting spectral 
where delta lambda is 5 nanometers. If you run it and you put wavelengths at 400, 420, 440, it's really computing the spectral as a 20 nanometer bandwidth, but in both cases you'll get basically the same number because you're dividing a bigger number by a bigger number, so it all shakes out. Okay, polarization, as I said, you, you really need to describe the polarization of the light. Uh, there's something called uh, the Stokes vector, and in order to describe polarization, you need four numbers, and the first number is how much light is there or how much energy without regard to the state of polarization. And that I in the Stokes vector is really what oceanographers call L, the radiance. And you'll get into that a little more. And then the Q and the U are needed to describe the state of plane polarization. And the V describes whether it's left or right circular polarization. And in general, light is a mixture of all these different states of polarization. So Ken was going to talk about this more uh, somewhere down the road. And in the meanwhile, you know, there is an ocean optics web book page that defines all these Stokes vectors and how they're measured. So you can look at that if you want to, or just wait for Ken. So in oceanography, historically, we haven't really paid much attention to polarization, um, although that's changing now. The polarization, though, does carry information about the environment because the state of polarization is affected by the size distribution, the shape of the particles, their index of refraction. So it carries information. We just haven't been using that information very much. And there's good reasons for that. First of all, you don't even have an instrument to measure the unpolarized volume scattering function. And now you're actually going to have to have instruments to measure a 4 by 4 matrix of volume scattering functions. And the VSF that we've been talking about says I've got unpolarized light coming in and it scatters and unpolarized light comes out. That's actually just the 1-1 one, one element of the 4 by 4 matrix. You could have unpolarized light coming in, linear coming out. You could have linear coming in in this direction, but linear coming out in another orientation and all of those things require in principle 16 volume scattering functions and we can't even measure the simplest one. So historically we, we just haven't been able to measure these things and Ken's just about the only guy uh, who going way back was measuring things like Stokes vectors and what are called Mueller matrices which are the vector version of the volume scattering function. Uh, the reason for not doing that is that the state of polarization is sort of thought to not have much effect on anything like phytoplankton photosynthesis or heating of water. So a phytoplankton doesn't really care what the polarization state of the light hitting it is. It just absorbs the energy and photosynthesizes. Now, I don't know if anybody's really done, you know, experiments with phytoplankton and linear polarization, but the argument is, well, the phytoplankton are randomly oriented, so, you know, it doesn't matter. Ken? No circular. Yeah, circular, I think, is a little bit different because that does matter because, for example, DNA is a helical molecule with a handedness, and so it's going to absorb right or left-handed circularly polarized light differently for sure, but in the ocean there's not much circular polarization. So once again the argument is, well, we don't need to worry about it. Yeah, yeah. So anyway, um, another thing is even if I have the polarized radiance distribution, most of the time we're in interested in an irradiance. So I'm going to take this radiance distribution and integrate over all the downwelling directions to get the downwelling plane irradiance. So the polarizations tend to average out. Over here it may be polarized like this and over here it's like this or something, but those kind of average out. And even though my radiances might be off by 10 or 20 percent, if I don't include polarization, 
my irradiances are only off by order of a percent, and that's good enough for most purposes. So we're going to talk a little bit about polarization here, but it hasn't quite made it into optical oceanography, with a few exceptions, though. There was a French satellite uh, polder that looked at the polarized light leaving the surface, and what they wanted to do, among other things, was be able to distinguish living particles from non-living particles, because a mineral particle, different index of refraction and so forth, will affect the polarized signal differently. So that's what they were looking at. Uh, just keep in mind, when you run hydrolyte, you're going to have errors of order 10% in radiance, and because it doesn't include polarization. But the radiance in this direction may be 10% too big, the radiance in that direction may be 10% too small, and when you integrate those to get an irradiance, those plus and minus errors tend to cancel out, and you still get irradiances on order of a percent. But in the future, there's definitely going to be more worrying about polarization, and I don't know the current thinking on the PACE instrument, whether it's going to have polarization or not. I don't know what the, it changes from day to day. Okay, so let's just look at radiance. Um, it's always kind of hard to plot because there's four variables at the minimum, four variables. And that's assuming the ocean's horizontally homogeneous, but things can vary with depth. And so here's a plot of downwelling radiance at selected depths here as a function of wavelength. So I'm going to look in one direction. So let's say I'm looking, uh, I'm looking upward, straight up, and I'm seeing the downwelling radiance. So it's going downward. And that's the little subscript D there, so watts per square meter per stradian per nanometer. And this is, you know, 10 meters, 50 meters, so on down. And this was just a particular run of hydrolyte. I just pulled out some chlorophyll or whatever and did a hydrolyte run. Um, and this is the sort of thing you see. So you can see as you go down in the water column, the blue is being absorbed out, the red is being absorbed. But then there's this bump here that's coming from blue or green light being fluoresced over to the red. So there's chlorophyll fluorescence. Notice you don't see it up at the surface, but it begins appearing as a noticeable part of the signal down here. A little strange thing here is you'll notice, okay, the black is the downwelling radiance in the air. So you're looking straight up at the sky, you're just above the sea surface. Now you go down just below the sea surface, depth zero, or even down to depth 10 meters, the radiance has actually increased when you went into the water. And I get lots of hydrolyte user questions saying, well, hydrolyte's not conserving energy because the radiance is bigger in the water than it was in the air, and I know that part of it was reflected. Well, I'll leave that as a sort of question as to how can radiance increase when you go into the water, and then once you get deep enough, now it starts decreasing again. You'll be able to, you know, answer that question by the end of the class, and you can do some hydrolyte runs and play around with this and see what's going on. But just keep in mind, it's the law of conservation of energy, not the law of conservation of radiance. And here's another plot. So this is radiance as a function of depth at selected directions for one wavelength. So here's LD, the zenith viewing. So I'm looking upward, I'm seeing the downwelling light. That's what was plotted in the previous figure. There's LU, upwelling radiance, or nadir viewing. I'm looking downward at the nadir. Or I'm in the water, I'm looking horizontally, I'm looking towards the sun at right angles or away from the sun. So the sun's up there. So there's just three plots there. You see the zenith viewing or the downwelling radi radiance. It increases down to about 10 meters and then it starts decreasing. The upwelling decreases all the way through. Looks a little strange, but you know, 
if you think about it, you'll be able to figure it out, do some hydrolyte runs, do some plots like this, and see what you can figure out. Here's a plot of the radiance as a function of the polar angle theta and the wavelength for a given depth and in the plane of the sun. So notice I said viewing direction theta v to make clear that this is the direction I'm looking now. Wavelength, we're at uh, 10 meters here. So in my coordinate system in hydrolyte, z is positive downward. So theta equals zero is downward. Theta equals 180 is upward for the direction the light travels. Now I've got, if we look here, zero is for the viewing direction, that's 180 degrees off. So this is really uh, the light that is traveling at 180 degrees, it's going upward, but I'm seeing it looking downward at direction zero. So that's the viewing direction of zero. I'm looking downward and I'm seeing this radiance here. I'm looking upward here and I'm seeing the bright sun up here and then I go around and I'm looking downward again. So then this point is the same as that one and here's the wavelengths and once again you see a little bump due to fluorescence. So it's always confusing when you see a plot like this. You kind of have to stop and say, well, wait a minute, is this theta or is it theta v? And what's its coordinate system? Oh, theta is zero downward. You know, and you can kind of then back up and say, okay, I'm looking downward, I'm looking towards the bright sun, and then I'm looking downward again. And it'll all make sense, but it's always confusing even for me. And that's at 10 meters if we go up to in the air. So here, I'm looking upward at the sun, it's very bright, and then I am looking, so there's the sun, I'm looking downward, and I'm looking horizontally, and then I look downward towards the sun, and all of a sudden there's another little peak here. Well, that's the sun's reflection that I'm looking at on the sea surface. So the way I've drawn this, the positive thetas I mean I'm in the plane, half plane where the sun is, the negative thetas, I'm in the plane opposite the sun. So I look down and all of a sudden now I'm looking at the sun's reflection and then I keep going around and I'm looking at the radiance leaving the water here. So, and you'll notice there's no very little bit of fluorescence that you actually see here. Okay, uh, enough said there. Here's another plot. This is now radiance as a function of theta and phi, but at a, uh, or a given wavelength, and it says just above the sea surface. So here, I'm sitting at the center of the sphere. I'm looking up at the sun, and then I'm looking down at the sun's reflection off of the surface for a level surface. So this number is like about 2% of that number, and then a log plot color-coded here. So th all of these plots were the same radiance distribution. They're just displayed in different ways. Okay, so if we go back to our Gaussian tube and just pull the tube off, now we have a detector here that's going to measure plane irradiance. Plane because the detector is a plane surface. So here's our diffuser wavelength filter and the actual detector down here. So this is probably the most commonly measured oceanic radiometric uh, property. And the theory says the surface here of the diffuser is equally sensitive to light from all directions. Now, no real material has that property, but ideally that's what you want. So. On the other hand, if I'm looking at this detector from straight on, so here's my little detector, or the diffuser, and it has some area delta A. So if I'm light that's coming in like this, I see the full delta A. If I'm coming in from the side, I don't see 
you know, the full size of the detector, I see less and less surface until I'm at 90 degrees and there's no surface. So that surface is being re reduced by a factor of cosine of theta, where this is theta. So the effective area of the detector decreases as the light comes in at a bigger and bigger angle to the normal. So when you make the measurement, you just stick the instrument out there and you get the number back. But if you want to compute this from the radiance, then you have to say, okay, I have the radiance distribution. That light's coming from all directions. But I have to weight it when I integrate over all directions. <coughs> I have to weight the radiance by a cosine factor to take into account that the same radiance coming straight down counts more than the same radiance coming in at an angle. <coughs> So uh, we've got a cosine, and then here's our element of solid angle, and we're going to integrate over 2 pi in phi and 0 to pi over 2 in theta. And if you want to get the upwelling radiance EU, it's the same thing. It's just pi over 2 to pi, and I put the cosine in absolute values because really if pi is greater than pi over 2, then the cosine is negative. But anyway, that's the definition or how you would compute a plane irradiance if you're given the radiance. And this is what hydrolyte does. It computes this by solving the radiative transfer equation, and then it uses this formula to integrate it and get the irradiance. And of course, this guy is now the joules per second, or watts, per unit area, per unit wavelength, with no steradian factor in there. Okay, so here's just example plots of ED. Uh, they look sort of the same as the radiance plots, kind of the same shape, but of course different units and different magnitudes. So here's just ED as a function of wavelength for a few selected depths. Uh, here's ED as a function of depth for selected wavelengths. And you notice something kind of weird. Here in the UV and the blue, the curve is almost straight on a linear log scale. So that means it's decreasing exponentially if it's linear on this log scale. So these are nice straight lines. But then at the longer wavelengths, they start out kind of in a straight line and then somewhere along the way they bend over and then they go down at a straight as a straight line so something weird is happening this water is homogeneous the irradiances here decrease exponentially with depth or linearly on a log scale and these have this weird kink where they start out at a very high rate of decrease and then they all level off. So something weird's going on there that you need to think about as you play with this stuff and do some hydrolyte runs and see if you can figure out what's happening here. Okay, there's something called the scalar irradiance. Now, plane irradiances, historically, everybody's measured those from day one. If you're a phytoplankton, you don't care if the light was coming this direction or that direction. You just grab it, you absorb it, you photosynthesize. So really what's relevant for phytoplankton photosynthesis or for heating of the water is just that you've absorbed light and it doesn't matter what direction it came from. So you make a spherical detector and it's got the same effective area for radiance in any direction. So they're the same thing you measure uh, you have a diffusing surface, you have some little area here where there's a filter and a detector, and you measure once again how many joules per second per unit surface area per unit wavelength, and you get, in this case, a downwelling scalar irradiance. Scalar meaning lights equal in all directions. And notice that there's a shield here, so any upwelling radiance is blocked. It's only radiance that's in downwelling directions that's measured. 
and then if I turn this upside down, I get the upwelling scaler, or if I remove the shield, then light from any direction can be detected, and that's then the total scalar, which is the E0D plus E0U. Now, if you give me the radiance, and I want to compute this, I don't have the cosine factor because the effective collecting area is the same for any direction. So you just take